Sí, buenos días a todos y a todas. Eh, bueno, pues hoy tenemos la suerte de contar con la presencia virtual de José Luis Zofío, que, bueno, además de ser colaborador habitual de varios de los miembros del, del Instituto, es catedrático de Fundamentos del Análisis Económico dentro del Departamento de Análisis Económico, Teoría Económica e Historia Económica de la Universidad Autónoma de Madrid y Visiting Fellow en este momento del Erasmus Research Institute of Management de la Erasmus University. Es además, o ha sido consultor de la Comisión Europea, de la Organización Mundial de la Propiedad Intelectual y del Ministerio de Educación y Ciencia de, de España. Eh, ha publicado alrededor de 50 artículos científicos, según la base de datos Scopus, con un índice H de 16 actualmente. Sus líneas de investigación se han centrado fundamentalmente en la medición de la eficiencia y la productividad, la organización industrial y la, la economía del medio ambiente. Eh, la innovación, la medición de la, la eficiencia en, en, la, en sistemas de, de innovación, la economía del transporte y también ha tocado eh, líneas de investigación como son los métodos computacionales, tanto en investigación operativa como en econometría, donde pues, ha, ha desarrollado junto a otros colaboradores eh, hasta, hasta tres... Eh, toolboxes de, de MATLAB, eh, alguna de ellas eh, ha, dado, ha dado además eh, como fruto un artículos eh, en la, en la prestigios, prestigiosa revista Journal of Statistical Software, que, que está, creo que es la número uno, JCR, en el área de estadística y, y probabilidad. Y bueno, y hoy viene, viene así virtualmente a hablarnos sobre la medición de eficiencia en los sistemas de innovación y su relación con los rendimientos a escala. Así que, José Luis, adelante. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Juan. Uh, I think I'm going to uh, give the seminar in English, if that is okay with you, since the slides are in English and uh, we might get used to that. Today I'm going to, to present uh, our most uh, recent paper on this uh, research uh, line that we have programmed on the evaluation of performance of innovation systems, national innovation systems. Uh, we have been working in this, um, in this area for, I would say, over 10 years now. Uh, we haven't been as productive as we might have wanted because, as you know, time is scarce and we, are, we have a lot of responsibilities and commitments. But uh, we, are, we are making breakthroughs uh, through very uh, important key papers in, in the literature, that's what I think. And today I'm going to present the last one, which is an analysis uh, on the nature of returns to scale on innovation activities, right? And how important it is to give advice and uh, give, um, yeah, for decision makers and innovation managers on how to assess their systems and how to learn from benchmarks on how to improve um, their, uh, their performance over time. This, uh, the, the study of, of the nature of returns to scale uh, on innovation hasn't really got much attention in the literature. So uh, up to this point, uh, everybody talks about that and why at some given point investing Uh, more quantity of resources on innovation activities doesn't pay off. The return is not as, as large as when you are starting. And this has been uh, studied from different perspectives, uh, among them by Juan Aparicio and, and some others in recent uh, papers uh, using Monquist productivity indices. But no one has really focused on, on the nature of returns to scale and to assess that, in fact, innovations uh, um, activities are subject to decreasing returns and this is what this is this is our main contribution to the literature with this paper is the existence of decreasing returns to innovation and this is what i'm going to talk about in the context of this whole research project right that we have uh, first i would like to give some information of the paper that i, that I am about to present uh, this paper is co-authored with uh, javier barbero Uh, which is affiliated now uh, to the University of Oviedo. He's also currently working at the uh, John Research Center uh, of the European Commission. And also John Mikel Zavala, who is at Deusto Business School and some other uh, uh, affiliated to some other universities in Norway and, and other places. Uh, they are attending the seminar, so if, if you feel like, like you want to jump in, just go ahead, make whatever remarks you might want. And even if there are some of the questions at the end that we, we feel that you might address better, answer better, 
uh, I, will, I will let you know. So thank you for being here, Javier and, and John. Um, the paper we just got, uh, we, we were informed uh, this weekend that has been finally accepted to, this, uh, to the Technovation Journal, which is a nice journal of, uh, from Elsevier, and uh, we believe it will have a, a large audience um it's it's uh, ranked uh, at a very high level so in that sense we are happy with with the final place where, where our paper has come to rest we can say um but nevertheless uh it will take like a month or two months to to be online so if anyone is interested in the paper on in uh, or these techniques that i'm going to talk about data development analysis um let me know and i will send the paper upon request okay well uh, what is this research program about? About measuring the performance of, of uh, national or regional innovation systems. Well, it's about making use of, of uh, a set of, of indicators that are part of what is known as the European Innovation Scoreboard uh, that is published uh, yearly by the European Union in a way to monitor the implementation of, of uh, innovation activities uh, by uh, the European member states. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, this innovation scoreboard is used to come up with uh, an index, what is, is known, this index is known as the Summary Innovation Index, which uh, ranks the different countries according to their performance. Uh, the way that this is done, however, is uh, quite simple, too simple, I can say, I might say, because this is nothing but the arithmetic average of these indicators, which as, a, as an aggregating function, as you know, is the simplest one, uh, but it really does not capture, or at least that's what we have been arguing or contending in the last years, doesn't really capture the performance of, of, uh, of innovation systems of the different countries. And we are, I'm going to argue this in what follows, why we don't agree with this, because they don't really uh, make a difference between uh, inputs or outputs, that is the efficiency of the systems. Um, what it really measures is, uh, we can say, as you can see here at the end of this slide, is the efficacy or effectiveness of, of innovation activities, of these investments in innovation activities. That is, if you reach a high level of outputs, regardless the amount of inputs but this is the, this differentiation between inputs and outputs is not really there in the european union uh, innovation scoreboard it's just simply a, a, an array of, of indicators that i'm going to show in the next slide okay and uh, they are simply aggregated uh, into into a, into a very simple indicator through the arithmetic mean, mean which allows to rank countries now what's the problem of this very simplistic approach that although it can be really under, uh, easily understood, sorry, by, by everyone, by the audience, by readers, by decision makers, in the end, it becomes a target in itself. That is what, what countries want to, to look or to do is to look well in this indicator. But this indicator, uh, using the, this very simplistic way, becomes uh, in, a, in a goal, becomes in a, in a target in itself, that really prevents to look at all this information from different angles, right? From different uh, goggles or, or glasses. And that's really a pity because we believe that all this information, it's really underused. It's not, it's not really analyzed by, by uh, scholars or, or stakeholders or anyone interested in the performance of innovation systems, right? And, and that's why we really want to come to all, that's why we have been working these past years in this research program, and this is how we contribute. Now, um, uh, these indicators has the idea of, of efficacy or effectiveness, that is, if it is an absolute idea of, of what's the level of innovation that a given country or that European countries reach, but has nothing to do with the idea of performance, understood as efficiency or productivity, which is a relative concept. That's how well you do with the resources that you have so as to accomplish those goals. Because if you don't have many resources, as I'm going to argue later on, uh, if you don't have much resources, we shouldn't expect much from you in a sense. What really matters is to, to have an idea of what you can achieve given your resources. 
And this is an idea of efficiency and productivity, how well you can do with your resources at hand. And what we will see is that the, uh, the, um, the well-known ranking of, of innovation countries is actually reversed. And this is what we have been publishing in the last five years. Okay, the European, the European Innovation Scoreboard is made of, of 27 indicators. We have them uh, here. There are indicators uh, uh, regarding the framework conditions for innovation within a country, institutional conditions, and required conditions. That's what they, this is the, the official denomination of the indicators, right? The, the, the official classification. We have framework conditions, investment, innovation activities, and impacts. Um, all these 20 uh, uh, indicators are classified according to these uh, categories that we have. Um, from there, we can go down into human resources, attractive research systems, innovation-friendly environment, institutions, and so on, okay? And all this information, uh, really, um, it's very expensive to collect. Uh, the European Union uh, devotes millions of euros every year just to commission these studies, to raise these indicators. But nobody, nobody's doing really a lot of the, much with, with these indicators because this, this uh, uh, um, let's say, uh, synthetic uh, innovation indicator that we have, the innovation indicator that the uh, European Commission publishes, is so simple and is so well understood by everyone that not many people is willing to go the distance to work with the indicators in a, in a different way. And, and that's really a pity. Now, as I said before, the Summary Innovation Index that, that the European Commission publishes is nothing but the average, the arithmetic average of the values of these indicators that range between zero and one because uh, they are normalized through a min-max specification, okay? But being normalized, what they do is that they take the average of the indicators and what we can see here is uh, in this uh, slide is uh, I mean this figure on the left is the performance of EU members okay according to to the indicators. Now what we can see here is that because you are using the arithmetic uh, the arithmetic uh, average of all the indicators, the more that you have in each one of these categories, the better you perform. And this is what we have here as as the basic idea of the Summary Innovation Index of the European Commission. But the more that you spend, the more that you get, regardless of inputs or outputs, the best rank you get uh, in, the, in the innovation system uh, between or among the European Union. And we can see, for example, that the um, European Union um, classifies uh, countries into four categories. Modest innovators, moderate innovators, strong innovators, and innovative leaders. And among the innovative leaders, which are these five countries, we have Sweden, Finland, Denmark, Netherlands, Luxembourg, which will be the usual suspects because they are rich countries. And therefore, they spend a lot of uh, resources, make a lot of investments in innovation. Of course, uh, Eastern European countries, on the contrary, like Romania or Bulgaria or Hungary, Poland, and so on, starting from the left, because they don't have enough resources, they get ranked as modest innovators. But the idea of, of this is how much money you invest and what are your results without taking into account the relationship that exists between the resources that, that at your disposal, that is the inputs, and the results that you get. So we have a paper with uh, Professor Edkist from Lund University from Sweden, which is a renowned scholar in, uh, in innovation, innovation evaluation, and so on, where we really challenge the idea that uh, the only way that we should look at uh, innovation is from the perspective of this, uh, from a quantitative uh, perspective, is from the perspective of, of, I say, the Summary Innovation Index. And we propose the use of productivity, efficiency techniques, uh, which are, uh, are capable of ranking observations based 
on the relative performance. So in this paper, uh, in, in Edquist et al. 2018, we challenged the, uh, the Summary Innovation Index as an indicator of performance, and we'd rather uh, um, support the idea that we should uh, resort to the literature on efficiency and productivity to calculate or, or at least come up with uh, a performance innovation indices that are based on, on the idea of efficiency and productivity, right, between the, the uh, Europe. Okay, so this is, this is the idea. And within this research framework, we study in this paper the nature of returns to scale. Okay, and why is that important? I'm going to argue now. Now, we, we characterize innovation systems as some, uh, innova some systems, excuse me, that materialize, transform innovation inputs into innovation outputs, all right? So in that paper, what we do is to categorize in a very systematic way, all these uh, uh, indicators that we have into inputs, and outputs, that is investments that you make and results that you get, which is something that the European Union doesn't do, okay? Later on, I will show you uh, how these are categorized, okay? But basically, the idea behind this is that we can come up with uh, a number of innovation, uh, uh, of indicators that, that can be considered of in, uh, uh, inputs of the system. This refer to resources like human, material, financial, and so on, that are used to create innovations, right? Bringing them into the market. And these innovation outputs correspond to some of the indicators that we have seen before and refer to new products and processes, design, community trademarks, and so on. Okay, that's, that's the idea. Okay, now, once you have this uh, uh, classification, um, what we argue is that you may have a high score of uh, input investments, which imply that you are going to, or through a, a great deal of effort, right, to the system, but that doesn't immediately imply that you will get a high score of outputs. If, if innovation activities are subject to decreasing returns to scale, that is, if you increase inputs, but as you increase inputs, outputs increase, but to a lower rate than the inputs, that's, a, that's the economic term of, of returns to scale. It's a, it's a very precise concept in economic theory. The, uh, the, the, the idea of returns to scale is if, if you increase inputs in a given proportion, let's say you double the inputs, and the outputs increase in the same proportion, then you have uh, a constant returns to scale. If you increase, uh, if the outputs increase less than double, you are subject to decreasing returns to scale. And if you increase inputs uh, by, by doubling them, uh, okay, and, but your output increases at a higher uh, amount, more than double, then you uh, enjoy, we can say, increasing returns to scale. So the idea that we bring in this paper is that high scores in inputs all right, from the perspective of the European Innovation Index, doesn't necessarily translate into higher scores of outputs. It's not the idea, right? And in that case, if the input side is, relatively speaking, much larger than the output side, okay, then your efficiency on your productivity will be, in general, uh, low, okay? And therefore, you should look at the way that you are spending the money. You are spending all these resources because perhaps it's not the best way to allocate those resources. However, if you just focus in the Summer Innovation Index of the European Commission and you come out as a, as a leading innovator, you don't really want to challenge yourself from the perspective of how well are you using these resources that you have at hand, okay? Because you never look at the idea of efficiency or productivity. Okay, being more precise, we, uh, in, in this uh, paper and uh, throughout this, uh, this research uh, project that we have, program that we have, what we do is to classificate the uh, European Innovation Scoreboard indicators into inputs and outputs. And we, after uh, carefully thinking and reflecting about this, we come up with a baseline model. I'll talk about, uh, I will talk about this uh, later on because we have some uh, minimum and extended models, but 
I'm going to go relatively fast through, through this part. We classify out of those 27 indicators uh, that, that I mentioned before, we select four indicators that can be identified as inputs of the innovation system, which is public R&D expenditures, venture capital investment, business R&D expenditures, and nor R&D innovation expenditures, all right? This, these four uh, indicators can be considered as inputs of the innovation system that are being transformed or yield or produce these outputs, which is a small and medium enterprises innovation in-house, uh, community trademarks, community designs, small and medium enterprises you know, uh, introducing product or process innovations, and so on. And these are indicators that are being measured by the European Union that we consider are products of the innovation system. Now, this is new to the, to, to the quite new to the literature and certainly new to the uh, European uh, Commission, which never really thinks in this way to assess or, uh, yeah, to assess the, the performance of innovation systems. Now, considering these inputs and outputs, we, as I said before, we rely on the methodology of efficiency measurement uh, uh, known, I will come up with this uh, later on, since uh, you, you will immediately rec recognize an optimizing program, and since you are from statistics and optimization and applied mathematics, you, might, you really might be interested into these methods. Uh, and you know that the Center for Operations Research there, many people are working on DEA, so um, this, is, this is part of their every bre uh, everyday bread and butter. And, and they are really familiar with this, but since you might not be familiar, I'm going to, to devote a couple of minutes, three minutes, to show you how, from a quantitative perspective, uh, we can measure the efficiency or productivity of an innovation system. So what we have here in, the, in, the, in this uh, figure is one uh, the, the input amounts that are normally known, denoted by X, input amounts, and here, in this axis, y axis, we have the output amount. All right, we have one input, one output. Clearly, what this methodology does is to define an envelopment that gives you, sorry, that gives you the higher amount of outputs that you can obtain give, given an amount of, of inputs. All right, and this is called envelopment because all these dots, great dots that we have here under the, the best practice frontier, which is estimated through the data development analysis methods, right? All these observations that we have that use a given amount of input to obtain output uh, will be inefficient because they lay below this production frontier, okay? So through, through quantitative methods like data development analysis or econometric techniques, what we do is to calculate if the distance between a given observation, let's say observation G here to this frontier, which means that if you are dominated by these observations from A through F, because you lay below this frontier, you are deemed as inefficient, okay? And you can measure the distance in a metric that is given, a, a, uh, um, let's say specifically by directional distance function, and in particular that introduced by Chambers, Chung, and Fair in 1996, because it's the one that we are using in this article, in this paper. Nevertheless, the idea of distance or an efficiency measure goes back at least to Farrell in 1957. So it's it really has more than uh, half a century of people working in this this idea of measuring efficiency and productivity. Okay, so the, the whole idea is that it, once you have been able to identify inputs and outputs, you can really measure if a, a given innovation system is efficient or not by calculating this directional distance function, okay? If you situate, lay on the production frontier, the distance to the frontier is zero and you are deemed as efficient. And if you lay inside the production possibility set that is uh, below this, this uh, envelopment that we have here, then you are inefficient and your directional distance function has a positive uh, value, okay? And the higher 
the distance, the worse is your performance as an innovation system. So it's monotonic in the sense that the larger it is, okay, the distance, the worse you are performing. Now, how do we calculate these distances? Well, this is done through a, a, a linear program. In this case, it's not linear, but it can be linearized. That's the whole idea. But I prefer to present it in this way because it gives you an idea of uh, why is this efficiency measure, uh, this distance to the frontier, can be interpreted in relative terms, okay, uh, as a productivity index, okay. Uh, here, what we have in this constraint, uh, this this first of constraints that we have here, is an index number that aggregates the outputs that are denoted by y through some very specific weights mu divided by a composite index, a virtual index of inputs, x, multiplied, weighted, aggregated through these uh, input weights, nu. And this is, a, this is the formulation of a productivity index, an output measure divided by an input measure. This is index number theory. And this is how we can relate the directional distance function proposed by Chambers uh, Chung and Fair in 1996 to a productivity index, the capability that observations have to transform inputs input into outputs. Now, what this mathematical program does is to identify the hyperplanes that define the production frontier for a given observation that is being evaluated, in this case, observation G. And through this Sorry, through this program, we get a measure of the distance, which is what we use to calculate uh, or determine the rank of innovation systems based on performance, on the idea of efficiency or productivity, uh, rather than the idea of the summary innovation index of the European Commission as the average of all indicators and consider that as performance, which we don't agree with. Now, relevant to, to this idea that we have here is that through this parameter that we have in the program, omega, the value, the optimal value of this parameter, numerical value that it has, will tell us if innovation activities are subject to decreasing constant or increasing returns to scale, which is very relevant to give advice to policymakers, like saying, stop ya, just putting money into the system without really considering where it is going because it turns out that if you are a rich country, if you are subject to decreasing returns to scale, you are really wasting your money. You better think on some ideas, some dimensions that might be, might, might be more relevant or significant to improve your performance than just spending money per se, investing per se. Nevertheless, if you have uh, increasing returns to scale, if you're subject to increasing returns to scale, the idea is that, okay, as you spend more money in, in inputs, it is suspected that your outputs will increase at a higher rate. And therefore, uh, what is relevant is the amount of resources that you use and not that much how these resources are spent, which is more an idea of developed countries, you know, that you have to be rather, rather uh, um, precise in the way that you are allocating your money, your resources into the innovation system, as opposed to countries, developing countries, that no matter, let's say, what they do, as long as they put money into the system, they know their performance is going to increase because they are subject to increasing returns, okay? So they don't really have to make a very uh, precise analysis of how the money is being spent because if you really spend your money uh, in, in the, uh, in higher quantities, this is going to pay off because you are really building a base for innovation, right? In human resources, in small and medium enterprises, and, and because you don't really have much resources devoted to that, uh, it doesn't really matter to be very chirurgical, let's say, sorry, in, into how you spend your money, which is uh, something that only very advanced countries should look at, as, as we will argue at the end. Anyway, this way, we can identify the nature of returns to scale. Now, there are some drawbacks of the standard DEA methods that are very technical. Um, basically, the idea 
that standard methods assign a, a value for the directional distance function that is zero. So all these observations that belong to the production frontier, A, B, C, D, E, and H, all these guys here on the frontier get the same numerical value, which is zero, which is the distance to the production frontier, right? Zero, because they define it. And therefore, you cannot really discriminate between these observations, which one is more efficient than the other. You, you really don't have a ranking of observations because as we will see, particularly in data development analysis, which is pro prone to what is, is called the uh, uh, um, uh, discriminatory course, uh, the, the, the dimensionality course, I should say, dimensionality course, because there are the dimensions, the number of inputs and outputs that we have is not very large, and therefore many observations get out, uh, turn out to be efficient. Okay, this is a problem of the standard DA methods. We know also that this, unless we introduce restrictions on this, uh, sorry, unless we introduce uh, weights, restrictions on the value of the input and output uh, in the uh, weights here, it could be the case that observations that do not use some key inputs or do not produce some key outputs are, and are assigned by the DEA methods a weight of zero, turn out to be efficient. And this is something that is really uh, something that is questionable. The sensitivity of these extreme observations, right, that have zero input and output weights, that's another drawback of standard DE methods. Anyway, and there is also a vulnerability to rank reversals. So in order to prevent that, in this paper, what we do is to evaluate the performance of a, of a given observation through what is known as the technique for order of preference by similarity to ideal solutions, which is called TOPSIS, right? What it does is to measure, basically, imagine that this is the observation that we are evaluating here. Now, here what we do is we measure the distance of this observation to the production frontier, which is called, uh, which is the ideal, let's say, production frontier. And then we measure the, the distance also, and, and this production frontier is configured, is made up of observations that obtain high, large quantities of outputs, why, given their input levels. But we also measure how far an observation is from the worst frontier. That is, that that is defined by the worst performing innovation systems. So we have a, a, two distances here, a dual uh, analysis based on, on the distance to the uh, best practice frontier and the worst practice frontier. Uh, this is done through DEA methods. It's called uh, the TOPSIS method because we create an ideal uh, virtual uh, innovation system with the maximum outputs and the minimum inputs we identify for this ideal observation that is not observed because it's made up uh, with the higher quantities of outputs and the minimum quantities of, of inputs, observed quantities. We measure the distance to this production frontier. In this case, it will be this, this facet here between this unit and this one here. And then we measure the distance of, of all observations to this best practice frontier, okay? We also come up with a virtual observation, which is called anti-ideal observation, which has the lowest amount of outputs, observed amount of outputs, and the highest amount of observed inputs. And we calculate the distance from this anti-ideal DMU to the worst performing frontier, okay? Calculating these distances, we can come up with an uh, indicator of performance, which is, which is called in the literature as the Relative Closeness Innovation, Innovation Index, okay? And this Relative Closeness Innovation Index, what tells you is it allows you to rank innovation systems, is made of basically all these distances that we calculate, all right, for each observation and the evaluation to the anti-ideal worst performing frontier, which is in the numerator, and also in the denominator, and the distance to the best practice frontier, uh, which is, can be found in the denominator. So here, the, the whole idea be, behind this, uh, this uh, index is that 
the farther away that you are from the worst performing frontiers observations and the closer you are to the best practice observations to the best practice frontier the better the higher is your your index and we calculate this index as we will show later okay but before we we go into the ranking of of innovation systems let me show you uh, uh, the results that we obtain from this dea program for all observations and in particular the parameter the uh, that tell us or inform us about the nature of returns to scale which is omega here now when you solve this program for the three years that we have in our sample 2010 2013 and 2016 what we basically find here or we divide the results into what is known as efficient innovation systems efficient dmus and inefficient innovation systems look that we have 31 countries in our sample but out of those 31 countries 25 are efficient define the production frontier this is the problem of of a standard dea methods that all these countries get allocated or or get a directional distance function of zero so we cannot really discriminate who is better or worse there between these 25 countries okay I'll, I'll come back to that later in 2013 as many as 24 countries are efficient are deemed efficient and in 2016 out of this those 31 countries 22 are efficient now what is relevant here is to show the nature of returns to scale okay this is this can be seen here by with the values of the omega parameter that i talked about earlier now looking at the value whether it's negative zero or positive we see that in general is that for 2013 even for efficient observations right the and particularly in 2016 all innovation systems that are efficient are subject to diminishing decreasing returns to scale and this is this is a very relevant finding it means that as you spend more money on the innovation system as you devote more resources to it you should expect that innovation outputs increase to a lower proportion okay you are subject to diminishing returns just as as in any let's say if if you double the amount of of uh, uh, people working in the uh, in in r d or the amount of money that is spent by the government government expenditures in r d or business expenditures in r d if you spend money obviously your your innovation outputs are going to increase but they are going to increase at a lower rate this is what we see and this is very relevant result and now for the inefficient innovation system for the inefficient uh, uh, observations we see again that most of the inefficient observations are being projected to uh, um, benchmarks that are subject to decreasing returns to scale so this is this is something that is very relevant and this is one of the main conclusions of the paper that rich countries investing money in innovation right should expect that their output grow to a lower rate than it does in developing countries okay so developing countries has an advantage have an advantage uh when from the perspective of performance of efficiency and productivity okay but this is normally overlooked by by the current publications by the current literature and by the european union themselves okay now what we have here in this table that i'm presenting is uh for 2016 the values of of the distances of um, each country to the best practice frontier which is this first column and the distance to the worst performing frontier which is negative in this case because you really you have to decrease outputs and increase inputs to reach this uh this uh, hyperplane let's say this worst practice frontier i can go back to this observation and we can see that increasing output and decreasing inputs moves you in this direction and this is a positive distance while if you have to move backwards then it is a negative distance that's why the indicator is defined in absolute values okay to capture the distance in absolute terms and and that's the whole idea but the raw the raw results that we are presenting here 
um, basically are four countries. Let me show you, for example, the case of Sweden. Sweden is, is among the countries that are is farther away from the best practice frontier, because in this case, it has a value of 6 point, uh, 0 0.692, which, among, which is among the highest values. Norway is even farther. Iceland is even farther. But you know, this is pretty far away from the, and it defines the worst performing frontier because it has a zero value. There is no distance to the worst performing frontier. So in this case, Sweden, as is the case of, of Iceland, for example, it's a country that is pretty far away from the best performing frontier and defines the worst performing frontier. This is shocking because Sweden always ranks the first in the performance, in the rank of, per of performance of the European Union because it's the country that most money expen uh, spends in, uh, in innovation inputs. But yet, from a relative perspective, from an efficiency or productivity per perspective, right, their relative uh, closeness in innovation index is very low, 0 0.3.7, 376, sorry, 0 0.376, and it ranks 27 out of the 31 countries that we study. And yet, the first country is Luxembourg and is Austria. So you still find rich countries there, but you can't just take for granted that because you spend a lot of money in innovation, you are going to make good use of that, of that money. Of course, it cannot be the case, particularly if you are subject to decreasing returns, okay, in, in innovation activities. All right, so using this uh, relative closeness innovation index, uh, which is new to the literature, we classify countries into four categories, very easy categories, which is high innovation inputs because they use a lot of inputs, and high innovation performance because their output levels are high. And these are classified as HIHP, high innovation, high performance. We find here countries that are developed, I mean, among the richest between the European Union, France, Netherlands, Denmark, Germany, Austria, and so on. Then we classify countries as high innovation inputs because they spend a lot of money uh, into innovation activities, but yet their output levels are low. So they have a low innovation performance, high innovation loan performance. And we find here countries like Sweden, as I said before, Finland, Switzerland, Estonia, and so on. Then we have countries which are not very rich, okay, uh, uh, are not among the, the richest countries between the EU, like Spain, like Slovakia, it, Italy, some Southern European countries, Portugal. And yet their output levels are not that bad. That will be the low innovation inputs, high performance countries. And then we have countries which do not uh, devote many resources to innovation activities and also do not get high innovation outputs. And here we have Lithuania, Poland, Croatia, Hungary. The whole idea is that we can graph this information here in this, in this graph. What we find here is the ranking of countries based on their innovation scale, for example, Sweden, Finland, Switzerland rank among the first, the, the top, the first countries in innovation inputs because they spend a lot. They are rich countries, Germany, Denmark, you can see that here, Belgium and so on. And in this axis here, we have the ranking based on the innovation performance. And we see that Sweden, Finland, Switzerland, right? Even if they spend a lot of money, their performance is not very good because their out output levels, given the amount of inputs that they use, is, is very reduced, very small. So this uh, uh, quadrant that we have here represents countries that spend a lot of money and share their performance is not that satisfactory, okay? It's, it's quite poor. And this could be surprising because this is, this is our, our, our paradigm, we can say, that innovation performance should take into account inputs and outputs, as opposed to the standard paradigm of the European Commission, which is the more the better. That is, the more innovation inputs that you have, and the better you are going to be, regardless of how many outputs you get. Okay, and that's that's the the whole idea of this innovation paradigm. That at least you know, if you don't spend uh, 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 spend much, you should not get much. That's the whole idea. But if you spend a lot, 
you should rank among the, the, the best performance, which is what you should expect. And this is this quadrant here, that the, the countries that spend a lot of money and that rank relatively well in, in performance, okay, in efficiency and productivity. Um, we, we find and we run some basic regression on the relative closeness innovation index, which is basically the, uh, the number that we get to rank countries and the scale measures the input quantities. And we find a weak relationship, still uh, a significant in most of the years, between input scale and performance. So uh, this means that the more inputs that you use in general, the less uh, uh, performance, uh, the, the worse performance, let's say, the, the lower is the rank in, in the relatively close innovation index. And this is due to decreasing returns to scale. OK, that's the whole idea. And we, we want to uh, introduce to our results a degree of robustness by considering not only the basic uh, uh, standard baseline model of four inputs and four outputs that I show at the beginning of the presentation, right? We not only use this, uh, this model of four inputs and eight outputs, but we also solve this uh, uh, DEA uh, uh, analysis with main with models that consider the basic minimum requirements for an to characterize an innovation system, which requires at least two inputs and three outputs. But also, we consider larger models that characterize innovation systems that include nine inputs and twelve outputs. We have. 15 possible different combinations for inputs and outputs, right? Sorry, of 15 possible combinations of inputs and 255 possible combinations of outputs, which gives a total of 4,096 combinations that we solve for each year. So we really compute this index 4,096 times using a wide range of inputs and outputs that characterize an innovation system. Okay. Here is a, I'm not going to go into this because you can find it in the paper, but these are the different inputs and outputs that are included in the model, in the different models. And it goes from our preferred baseline model, which is the one that we use to illustrate our results and calculate uh, the nature of returns to scale, decreasing returns to scale. But we also have models which only consider two outputs and three, uh, two inputs, sorry, and three outputs, or nine inputs and 12 outputs. And we consider all the possible combinations. And what we have here is a box plot analysis of the ranking of the innovation system, countries' innovation systems, into these 4,096 uh, possible combinations. So we can see here, for example, that if we go to Sweden, Sweden quite persistently ranks in the worst positions. The best position that it has out of these 4,096 possible models is the 22nd. So Sweden quite robustly it ranks at the lowest tail of the of the ranking scale, right? That's 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 the whole idea. And yet you have other countries that systematically rank in the best positions, like Ireland, okay, even Italy, we see here, even Spain is not bad. Okay, so this is the idea of 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 uh, of a robust um analysis that considers many different possibilities of of describing characterizing innovation system based on the uh, on the outputs and the inputs so here here luxembourg again is is a country that systematically ranks in the first positions mostly in the first place as a matter of fact and the whole idea behind this is that the received knowledge that's what it's called the uh, innovation leaders uh, should be the Scandinavian countries, the rich countries of the Northern Europe. Well, if you look at it based on the from the perspective of efficiency and productivity, this is not always the case, and therefore they should they shouldn't be just lay back and and uh, you know pat themselves in the back saying oh how good we are you know how well we are performing in our innovation system because yes they they do get high from a, an absolute per perspective high values right but they use a lot of inputs to achieve those goals, the high values of outputs. So this is basically the discussion that, that 
that I just made uh, on, on the, the last slide of my presentation, uh, that the whole idea is that what is termed as innovation leaders by, by the EU, hmm? if you take a look at how these countries perform from an efficiency or productivity perspective, right? This is not the case. They, they might not be the leaders. Some others are indeed leaders, like the Netherlands, like Germany, Germany as, we, uh, as we pointed out before through, through these uh, uh, quadrants, right? Some, some others indeed are leaders, both from the perspective of uh, the amount of outputs that they get, but also the, uh, the productivity of the inputs that they use, what they get from their inputs, right? But some others are not. And this has been overlooked in the literature until now. That's, that's the whole idea, okay? And, uh, well, the reason why this happens to a great extent for, some, for many of these countries is because there is the pervasive existence of decreasing returns to scale in innovation investments. This is something that, that is observed in general. And this has been also overlooked in the literature. And this is what we bring into this paper. Okay, so the whole idea is that innovation leaders, generally speaking, invest many, a vast amount of resources, but they don't really manage to get out of those resources as much as other countries, particularly less developed countries like Southern European, European countries, okay, Southern Europe countries. And therefore, while uh, what the policy implications of this is that countries with fewer resources really cannot afford to misuse those those uh, a small amount of money that they have, these this, uh, resources that they have. So they really have to take, you know, a look on the um, um, the reference benchmarks, the innovation systems that are, are identified as efficient by our analysis so as to match their performance, so as to see how they can learn from those, from those efficient, uh, uh, those who rank best in the relative uh, closeness innovation index that we have uh, uh, calculated, okay? And from there, they can learn what their peers are and how to improve their performance. And for rich countries, what analysis shows is that you cannot just take for granted that because you spend a lot of money in innovation activities, you're going to get, you know, higher uh, amount of outputs, patents, you know, uh, um, uh, publications, uh, PhD students, whatever, you know, that you might think, uh, you know, all kind of innovation, performance in processes or, or products, it, trademarks. No, you cannot take for granted that this is going to happen because, uh, because you are subject to diminishing returns and therefore it can may, may be the case that even if you spend a lot of money, you don't get as much as you might think that you're going to get. And therefore you don't rank uh, really at the top of the productivity or the efficiency ladder as, as uh, you might have expected. Well, I'm going to stop right here. I hope the, that the, the general idea of this paper, uh, you know, I have been able to, to uh, show it to you and to make you understand it and uh, I have explained myself. And now let's open a round of questions or, or, or comments that you might have, uh, which uh, I am, you know, my co-authors and I are, are happy to, to answer. So thank you very much. Thank you. Eh, vamos a ver, una, una, una pequeña duda que tengo. Eh, los puntos de los que eliges tú arriba y abajo, esos que están los más alejados, ¿no? el ah. mejor y el peor, por decirlo de alguna forma, eh, ¿utilizas eh, funciones eh, dis, distancia, de distancia direccional, ¿no? DPF, sí. eh, precisamente porque tienes que dirigirte a un punto fijo, ¿correcto? que sí. la has llamado aquí IS, I, A, I, S. ¿Es correcto sí. eso? Eh, es correcto, a ver, eh, eh, hasta cierto punto. Esta, esta metodología lo que hace es que con una unidad virtual, que es la Ideal Innovation System o el sistema de innovación sí. real, identificamos el hiperplano de referencia que luego vamos a utilizar para medir la distancia de, todos, de todas las observaciones. Es decir, que que eh, es como un, un proceso en dos pasos en el que en el primer paso identificas un hiperplano de referencia que es aquel del, del sistema de innovación ideal y ese es el que ya consideras como fijo para todo el resto. Por ejemplo, en esta figura, 
este hiperplano que aparece aquí no sería jamás utilizado para medir la eficiencia. ¿Por qué? Porque el hiperplano que se utiliza es este que aparece eh, eh, con la línea discontinua, porque ese es el hiperplano que ha identificado el sistema de innovación ideal. No sé si me he explicado. Y a partir de ahí, sí. si tienes tiene razón, eh, te mueves en una dirección que en la función de distancia direccional, que no he entrado porque es una cuestión muy técnica, es la dirección que marca el vector G direccional en la literatura, se conoce así, que te lleva en esa dirección y que aunque no lo he dicho, en este ejercicio que nosotros hacemos es común a todas las observaciones para que nos movamos en la misma dirección, que es la media de los inputs y los outputs observados. O sea, que la dirección eh, se corresponde con el valor medio de los inputs y los outputs. Y luego, disculpa y acabo, eh, eh, medimos la distancia a la, a la frontera que peor rendimiento tiene, ¿no? la worst performing eh, eh, frontier, y esa cómo la sacamos, pues creamos una, una unidad virtual que es la antideal o la peor, que es la que utiliza los más, máximos in, inputs y obtiene los menores outputs, identificamos la frontera peor, que es esta que tenemos aquí, y medimos la distancia de todas las observaciones a esa frontera peor. Esa es la idea. No sé si me la, has... frontera, la frontera peor es también un hiperplano. Sí, la frontera peor es un hiperplano, efectivamente. Es un hiperplano que se, que se identifica con un programa DEA que está en el artículo, eh, pero que en realidad no, no, no lo he puesto. Pero sí, efectivamente. Ya, ya. Sí. Vale, vale. Es hacer un DEA, es hacer un DEA de supereficiencia para los que estáis más, más eh, familiarizados con DEA. Es un día de supereficiencia, pero donde la supereficiencia no es de una observación observada, sino de una ideal o antideal. Eso es. De acuerdo. Gracias. No, gracias a ti. José Luis, eh, lo primero, muchísimas gracias, obviamente. <risa> no. muchísimas, muchísimas gracias por, por la charla, por el seminario. Yo creo que los estudiantes de doctorado y, y, y algún no estudiante de doctorado también habrá aprendido mucho. Um, porque lo has contado de forma muy, no sé, muy pedagógica, didáctica, eh, para que todo el mundo se entendiera, entendiera las, las bases de lo que hay detrás, eh, de planteamiento de, de lo que es en sí eh, la base de datos y lo que se pretende hacer, como la metodología, con el poco tiempo que se tiene. <risa> el asunto de, de dividir las variables en inputs y, y outputs de innovación, ¿no? Eso ya en sí es polémico, ¿no? Lo que pasa es que afortunadamente como ya hay literatura de la que tirar pues hay un modelo afianzado y se sí. puede se puede utilizar yo mismo lo he usado así que lo voy a defender obviamente a muerte sí. pero sí ya, ya ya en sí es polémico seguro para, ya para, para empezar no eh, sobre el tema de el tema del método no en, en sí sabes que soy más de metodología así que sí, sí, no, no. Puedo hablar más del método. A mí, a mí particularmente lo que no me... Bueno, a ver, Topsis no es que me enamore. No, no, llego, no, no, no creo que haya una justificación microeconómica, de, axiomática, detrás de, de la estimación de esa frontera, de la peor frontera. O sea, de la best practice frontier, sí, de la worst practice frontier, no, no lo tengo tan claro. Eh, bueno, no creo que lo tenga claro nadie. Es decir, no, no, no hay un, una axiomática detrás ¿no? que sustente la generación de eso, más allá de, bueno, que te permite hacer luego discriminación de cosas y tal, pero, ¿no? Sobre el tema de los inputs y outputs, efectivamente, digamos que, que apoyándote en la teoría de la producción, de lo que, se, mm. lo que se debe considerar como un input, ¿no? Como una inversión, como un gasto, ¿no? Sí. Que, que una, una institución, una, una, sí, una, una organización hace... Eh, y, y desde ese punto de vista, como pueden ser gastos, gastos en recursos humanos o, o en términos de, por ejemplo, tenemos aquí eh, la penetración de las, de las tecnologías de la información y la comunicación, es decir, una serie de, de gastos o de contextos institucionales que deben facilitar el desarrollo ¿no? de, 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 de las actividades innovadoras, pues la verdad es que revolviendo, o memoria, revolviendo, perdón, eh, eh, apoyándote en la teoría de la producción, sí que es posible pensar, como sería en una empresa o en un sistema, clasificar inputs y outputs. Eso ya creo que está bastante asestado en la literatura. El problema es cuáles son los inputs y outputs que tienes que considerar entre todos estos que tenemos aquí. 
¿no? Y, y, por ejemplo, desde un punto de vista de un análisis econométrico, muchos de ellos estarían correlacionados, con lo cual nos daría problemas para, para considerarlos todos, tendríamos que dejar caer alguno o hacer un análisis de componentes principales, etcétera, etcétera, ¿no? Desde un punto de vista, digamos, paramétrico. Es un lío, pero se ha hecho también, o se ha propuesto al menos en la literatura. En DEA eso no se puede hacer. Bueno, hay métodos también para seleccionar inputs y outputs. Por ejemplo, Jesús tiene algunos artículos, ¿no? Eh, eh, sí. Cuando, sin, eh, al objeto, por ejemplo, de evitar el, 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 digamos, la maldición esta de la dimensionalidad que he hablado antes, ¿no? Eh, el, tema, el tema que yo veo es que aquí no está, o sea, no, no, hay, no se plantean tantos estos problemas en, en la clasificación de inputs y outputs, pero sí en la, la elección. Y precisamente porque los evaluadores y los lectores siempre tienen, siempre tienen problemas, hemos hecho este análisis de robustez que es, ala, pues por así decirlo, a fuerza bruta, voy a resolver 4.096 DAs distintos para cada eh, modelo y vamos a ver cómo de robusto es el resultado. Y bueno, pues queda bastante robusto, sobre todo para los extremos, ¿no? Los que, los que siempre están mal. Da igual que sea con un modelo de cuatro inputs y ocho outputs o uno de dos inputs y tres outputs también van a estar mal, por ejemplo Suecia. O, o, o un modelo de muchos más inputs y outputs también aparece mal, que eso, eso eh, eh, es muy robusto porque no importa los inputs y outputs que utilices, va a salir así. Y ahora, de todas formas, si luego, repito, voy a, eh, eh, voy a dejar y dar la palabra pues, a, a Johnny o Javier si quieren eh, entrar. Y luego llegamos a esto. Claro. Esto en sí, efectivamente, ¿cuál es, ¿cuál es la idea que hay detrás de la, de la frontera antiideal? Bueno, pues la idea única y exclusivamente es que puedas aprender, entre comillas, para bien, de quiénes son las observaciones que peor eh, comportamiento tienen. ¿Por qué? Pues para, igual quieres, quieres acercarte a ellos, también en un momento determinado te, podrías decir, ¿qué puedo aprender de lo que peor hacen las cosas? ¿Y cuáles serían... Los que peor hacen las cosas, pues aquellos que son identificados como los peores por este sistema antiideal. Entonces, es simplemente una cuestión, no tanto metodológica, axiomática, basada en una teoría, ¿no? de, eh, digamos, de, de comportamiento óptimo y, y de performance, de, 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 sino más bien es algo práctico, de que tú puedas identificar, digamos, igual que quieres identificar eh, peers, ¿no? o sea, eh, modelos de referencia para acercarte a ellos, pues quieres también identificar a aquellos que lo hacen peor para alejarte de ellos. Esa es la idea. Y, o, por ejemplo, eh, en el caso de Suecia, todos lo que, los que tienen un cero en la, en la, en la distancia a la, a la, al hiperplano que peor, eh, eh, que peor lo hace, que son las que tienen un cero, Islandia, Suecia, podemos ver aquí Polonia, pues es que estos países realmente están difer, eh, eh, definiendo el hiperplano peor. Y por tanto, pues es que lo están haciendo muy mal. O sea, que es una forma también de identificar, es como si hicieras un ranking desde abajo también. Me explico, no solo desde arriba, sino también desde abajo. Pero estoy de acuerdo en que es una cuestión eminentemente práctica. Tiene como objetivo, por ejemplo, el que tú puedas hacer un, un, un índice ¿eh? que, que tenga una mayor variabilidad, porque estás metiendo distancia a lo mejor y distancia hacia lo peor. Y, es la, y, y, y finalmente es la idea de que puedas aprender también de los que peor lo hacen, porque igual que puedes aprender de quienes mejor lo hacen, pues también puedes aprender de, que, de los modelos, de los sistemas de innovación de los países que peor lo hacen, ¿no? Digamos, esa es la idea. Vale, muchas gracias. Hay una pregunta en el chat, José Luis. Dices que cómo se calculan los pesos óptimos en, en una fórmula para... Claro, ese es el tema, que... Eh, si nos vamos a, a la metodología DEA, que es esta que tenemos aquí, y, y, y con los outputs y los inputs observados, tú resuelves este programa, estos, estos pesos son endógenos. El, el, el sistema, eh, el programa, busca aquellos pesos que te van a hacer a ti parecer lo mejor posible. Es decir, en este caso que van a intentar minimizar la distancia a, eh, a la frontera. Con lo cual, si con, un, con una combinación de eh, pesos de inputs y outputs, ¿no? los, los nus y los mus estos que tenemos aquí, que son endógenos, como podéis ver, son las variables de decisión de la función objetivo, conjuntamente con el parámetro de escala. Si buscando esos pesos favorables, tú puedes crear un hiperplano de referencia al que perteneces, por ejemplo, F, este hiperplano, D, este hiperplano que tenemos aquí, o este, o D, entonces va a parecer como eficiente. Es decir, el, el, el DEA, la técnica DEA, lo que hace es que busca estos pesos más favorables. Y finalmente, 
si la distancia, si, el, si la función objetivo tiene un valor mayor que cero, significa que aunque el programa ha intentado, ¿sí? ha intentado eh, maximizar este ratio, este cociente de outputs agregados a inputs agregados, eh, restándole este parámetro que caracteriza los rendimientos a escala, eh, si no ha conseguido hacer eso, entonces la distancia es positiva. Y, y, y claro, es la, es la distancia considerando, perdón, es la distancia, disculpad, es la distancia considerando que eh, 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 los mejores pesos posibles que se te han podido asignar. Por ejemplo, mira, Luxemburgo, ¿para qué han preguntado esto? Luxemburgo, Malta, Eslovaquia, el Reino Unido conforman la frontera eficiente porque la distancia es cero. El resto de países que tienen una distancia positiva es porque el programa DEA no ha podido encontrar eh, unos pesos que hagan esto cero. Es decir, no ha podido encontrar un hiperplano de referencia eh, de la frontera al que tú puedas pertenecer. Y es en este gráfico, por ejemplo, pues son los puntos que están por debajo de estos hiperplanos. No sé si me he explicado, espero haberme explicado. El programa busca esos hiperplanos y mira a ver si tú puedes pertenecer a alguno de ellos. ¿Vale? Esa es la idea. Sí. Oye, más, más cosas. Es, es, es la cuestión esta de, de que en DEA se, se hace un análisis puramente de, descriptivo, no inferencial. No inferencial. Sí. Correcto. Claro, esto tiene aquí repercusiones, por ejemplo, sobre, bueno, una de las partes, uno de los objetivos del propio artículo, ¿no? Que es el asunto de ver qué sucede con los rendimientos a escala. Al final sí. se hace un análisis que es, creo yo, descriptivo, ¿no? No, claro, supongo que es difícil hacer algo inferencial. Eh, ¿Qué Infer pensáis? Bueno, a ver, a ver, hay cosas inferenciales, ¿eh? por, por ejemplo, para el tema de rendimientos a escala, hay, hay artículos recientes de Simari Wilson de, de, del año pasado, este de, de NAEP, con Simari Wilson del 2016, eh, para, para, para testear algún tipo de hipótesis sobre convexidad, no convexidad. Uh, sí. jugando con FDA, HDA, eh. sí. es decir, que cositas hay, quiero decir. Este ya, eh, 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 el tema es que nosotros, por ejemplo, no hemos calculado para los 4.096 modelos posibles, para los 4.096 modelos posibles, el parámetro omega, que igual deberíamos haberlo hecho, este hecho se podría haber hecho, porque como en realidad... El, o sea, que eh, eso es un asunto más de robustez, es que no es exactamente, eh, no es exactamente ahora, lo mismo. Ahora, ahora comento, o sea, a lo mejor no, me, no te he entendido bien, Juan, o sea, la historia es la siguiente. Eh, el problema que tiene el DEA es que nosotros podíamos haber hecho un análisis de bootstrapping y contrastar la hipótesis de si el omega es distinto de cero o no, recurriendo a las técnicas de Simar y Wilson, que sí. es hacer un resampling ¿no? de, sí. de todo esto y a partir de ahí establecer unos intervalos de confianza y ver si efectivamente ese valor del omega que hemos obtenido es, es estadísticamente distinto de cero o no. Eso, por ejemplo, lo podríamos haber hecho en la idea de dar robustez a nuestros resultados desde el punto de vista inferencial, que entiendo que es a lo que te refieres. Sí, sí, sí. sí. Esto, esto sí que lo podríamos haber hecho. Eh, eh, si, de hecho, si nos lo hubieran pedido los evaluadores. Eh, pero la idea fundamental es que eh, nos parece que, dado los resultados que obtenemos de los rankings y, y, y realmente el hecho de que, por ejemplo, en 2016, todo ese parámetro que obtenemos de los rendimientos a escala y para los, las eficientes y las ineficientes es que es, es sistemáticamente mayor que cero. Ahora, si tú me preguntas, ¿pero cómo sabes si eso es estadísticamente distinto de cero o no? La respuesta es que no, no te puedo contestar, evidentemente, con la, con, la, con la información que hay en el artículo. Porque para eso hubiéramos tenido que recurrir a, a, a bustrapear, por así decir, este parámetro con un modelo a la Simar y Wilson u otros que podamos pensar, pero básicamente es bootstrapping, no, sí. hay, no hay otra cosa. De todas formas, es que es difícil dar el salto de inferencia porque tenéis pocos datos en el fondo, porque habría que irse más a un análisis de regiones, que sé que eso información existe, regiones de sí. Europa. Podría Entonces, ser. Sí que tienes bueno, claro. tamaños muestrales más grandes con los que jugar también. Y... Eso, es, eso está claro, pero un bootstrapping, por ejemplo, puedes hacer con 2.000 muestras, con 3.000, el resampling ahí, ¿sabes a lo que me refiero? Pues, no, pues, sí, lo que pasa es que siempre estás trabajando con los mismos sí. países. Sí, que son poquitas claro, cantidades, claro. poquitas sí, sí, de sí. Bus, pero bueno, con lo, mismo repites, mismo. Repites. lo máximo que podríamos hacer es llegar a este modelo de 9 inputs y 12 outputs, que serían veintitantas variables, pero es algo que en general, porque ten en cuenta que efectivamente con lo regional ampliamos la base de las, de las observaciones, pero no de las variables, porque eso está limitado, no hay más. O sea, 
Pero no, no me que... preocupan las variables, que si son las variables, realmente no. las, las representativas del modelo de forma, digamos, teórica, por decirlo así, son, la, son, son clave, pues me parece bien, ¿no? Es un tema ya de, de potencia de test, sí. tamaño muestral y demás. De hecho, perdona, pero en, en, la, en la toolbox que tenemos, por ejemplo, en, en MATLAB del Journal of Statistical Software, pues eh, está programado eh, el, el, el determinar si hay rendimientos constantes a escala o no. Porque, por ejemplo, para testear si un índice de Malquis lo tienes que, que eh, descomponer en, en elementos que tengan en cuenta la escala de operaciones, pues si ya directamente te queda que el DEA es descarta la existencia de rendimientos variables, pues no tienes por qué eh, eh, pensar que, que la, los, los, eh, los rendimientos a escala van a contribuir a la productividad o no, porque ya lo has descartado previamente con un bootstrapping. Y eso, eso está hecho. De hecho, podríamos haber aplicado al modelo el bootstrapping de, de a ver si me explico, de, eh, para que me entiendas, eh, el bootstrapping del modelo de anormal, este que tenemos aquí, eh, para contrastar si el omega es distinto de cero o no. Y yo estoy seguro que aplicando eso eh, 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 nos hubiera quedado que es distinto de cero. Pero luego eso es distinto. El hecho de que exista una tecnología, entre comillas, es decir, unos sistemas de innovación sujetos a rendimientos variables a escala, es distinto que luego decir si esos rendimientos variables, que ahí está la idea, son constantes, decrecientes o crecientes. Efectivamente. Sí. Efectivamente. Eh, yo, mi, eh, eh, Javier, no sé si estáis silenciados o no, si queréis decir algo o... o... O añadir algo eh, del impacto, yo me a lo mejor de esto, del programa que tenemos con Cotec o nada, cinco minutos, ni eso. Sí, bueno, yo soy John Miquel, agradecer eh, a, pues a Juan y a, a Jesús y al CIO, obviamente, la, la invitación que le, que le cursaron a José Luis para que pudiera presentar este, este trabajo. Y agradecer a José Luis su, su generosidad, por un lado, por, por querer compartirlo y, en segundo lugar, por la claridad con la que, con la que lo he contado, que siempre... Es siempre un placer poder escucharle y, y es un lujo poder tenerlo como, como colega profesional. Así que gracias a, a José Luis y obviamente gracias también a, a Javier, que Javier no es de aquellos que le conocemos, no es de, no es de mucho hablar, pero que, pero que sabemos que es uno de los, de los fieles del equipo y que siempre está dispuesta a contribuir y también agradecer a, a Javier la, la generosidad. Y bueno, como, como, como comentaba José Luis, eh, pues este trabajo pues es, una, es un aspecto muy, meramente práctico eh, se sale un poco de la disciplina a la que queremos contribuir cuando José Luis apuntaba a la, la contribución del artículo. ¿no? Se sale un poco de la disciplina del, del operational research, no es nuestro target en este caso con este artículo, a pesar de que tiene una contribución metodológica, pero sobre todo es el, el, el poder eh, contribuir a una literatura que es distinta, que es en este caso en la que, de la que yo vengo, que es la que, la que se denomina como estudios de innovación. ¿no? Es donde se habla sobre políticas de innovación y ahí es donde vemos que hay una, una literatura que metodológicamente pues, todavía sigue siendo muy débil, como ilustra pues, la media aritmética, que sigue siendo el, el, el diseño dominante, ¿no? que es lo que, lo, que, lo que perdura y lo que tiene un impacto a la hora de definir las políticas todavía a, a nivel nacional, incluso regional. ¿no? Cuando Juan también apuntaba al hecho de que se pueda hablar de, de regiones como, como de MEUS para en el análisis. ¿no? Entonces, pues esto es algo en lo que, a lo que queremos, eh, con lo que queremos romper, ¿no? Con esta idea del cuanto más mejor, de cuanto más inviertas, más va, mejor desempeño, mejor performance va a tener tu territorio, ¿no? Y claramente nuestra, nuestra investigación apunta a que, esto, a que esto no es así, ¿no? Que hay otra serie de, de aspectos que se, tiene, que se deben tener en cuenta. Y esto en nuestra literatura es lo que se llama, en, para aquellos que igual hayas leído algo sobre... Sobre innovación es lo que se llama como el modelo lineal de la innovación, ¿no? Que aquella que dice que, bueno, inviertes en I más D y aquello que inviertas en I más D va a ir generando una serie de externalidades en una caja negra que nadie sabe muy bien cómo funciona, que luego va a tener un impacto en el crecimiento económico, ¿no? Entonces, nosotros lo que queremos es abrir es un poco esa caja negra y ver que, bueno, siendo la I más D importante, hay otro tipo de, de políticas, en este caso, que también son igualmente o más, de, más importantes, si cabe, en algunos países, pues porque la, la I más D ya está saturada, ¿no? Y en gran medida, pues cuando vemos que eso es Suecia, Finlandia, etcétera, aparecen en posiciones en el ranking muy, muy alejadas de lo que uno a priori podría esperar en base a, nuestro, a nuestros resultados, pues en gran medida es eh, debido a eso, ¿no? A que la política de, de ciencia y tecnología ya está saturada, invierte en una barbaridad y por lo tanto para poder obtener un resultado equivalente 
en términos económicos a aquello que has invertido, tendría, pues tendría que tener unas implicaciones muy, muy grandes aquella investigación que se está haciendo. ¿no? Y por lo tanto, queremos abrir esa, esa caja y decir que, bueno, aparte de la política de I más D, pues son necesarias también otras políticas. ¿no? Entonces, un poco lo que discutimos en las implicaciones del artículo, ¿no? es abrir esa, esa caja negra y tratar de romper esa parte de del cuanto más mejor. Entonces, bueno, en términos de, de investigación, como, como decía, se sale bastante de lo que queremos hacer, de lo que se hace dentro del CIO o de, de, la, de la parte de investigación operativa. ¿no? Entonces, nosotros cogemos esa investigación que, que vosotros eh, domináis y que controláis sobre investigación operativa para aplicarla en un ámbito en el que todavía ese debate no está, no está, no está consolidado ¿no? y queremos contribuir a, a bueno, a... A, a, a hacer un poco más tangible, a tangibilizar esa, esas contribuciones científicas que existen, pero que sin embargo pues están underexploited en muchos casos, ¿no? no se están utilizando y creemos que pueden ser útiles para, para poder definir en nuestro caso en concreto pues políticas de innovación que tendrían un mayor impacto en beneficio en última instancia de los, de los ciudadanos. ¿no? Sí, efectivamente. De hecho, una de las cuestiones que querríamos hacer es involucrar a los stakeholders que es algo que, que vemos difícil, pero que sería pedirles opinión para poder poner restricciones sobre los pesos, que es el comentario que ha hecho uno de los estudiantes, creo. Es decir, sí. eh, si nosotros eh, eh, no, no tenemos claro cómo debemos caracterizar las relaciones entre los inputs y los outputs de un sistema de innovación, pues si vas a los expertos y te dicen que, que los pesos de, del gasto de más de en, en, por parte del gobierno, ¿de acuerdo? Tiene que ser el doble que el del sector privado, o al revés, pongamos un ejemplo, o hay un modelo detrás de triple hélice que dice que tiene que existir eh, inputs desde el punto de vista de las empresas, de las universidades y del sector público. Todo esto, es, todo esto se puede materializar luego cuantitativamente y a nosotros nos encantaría poder sí. contar con un panel de 20 personas, 20 expertos, stakeholders, que nos dijeran cuál es esto, para luego resolver esto desde un punto de vista de que tuviera también un impacto, un impacto desde el punto de vista de la política de innovación, porque claro, esto no lo ene, entre comillas, no lo ene nadie, esto es, un, esto es un trabajo académico y lo que queremos es llegar a, los, a las personas pues, que utilizan estos datos y que plantean las políticas de innovación, ¿no? Y que no, no, no caigan en la complacencia si son ricos o si, si son países pobres que sigan, todos digan, tenemos que ser como Suecia, pues, pues no, porque es que a lo mejor realmente tu estructura productiva y tu estructura de innovación se acerca a otros países que no son Suecia para nada, porque tu tamaño, porque tu población... Y esto es difícil luego de hacerlo entender. Transmitir. Eso es. Oye, que muchísimas gracias a los dos. Gracias, Yomi, también por participar. No, no, que bien. Gracias a vosotros.